Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to introduce um, Olivia and Nicholas for their live demo. That's it, right? Live demo of uh, White Rabbit, which is combining threat intelligence, public blockchain data, and machine learning to go down the dirty money rabbit hole. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Olivia, um, an engineer at TrueStar, and this is Nick, my partner for the so, team. Yeah, I'm lead data scientist at TrueStar. Um, so. Um, so we uh, became interested in doing this research and building this tool um, since every day we work on how, uh, on finding better ways for security teams and analysts to make use of the information. So with the rise of cryptocurrency um, in general, but also in the security context um, in these last few years, we decided to investigate that further um, in our tool. So, um, as you all probably know, ransomware campaigns have been evolving um, their, uh, pay their payment methods um, from prepaid debit cards to cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Monero in recent years. Um, and there's plenty of reasons for why um, uh, Bitcoin, um, which we're specifically looking at in our demo, could be appealing to these attackers. So first of all, it's, a decent it's decentralized and pseudo-anonymous, which allows for, them, for attackers to easily hide their tracks. And um, for them to easily be able to launder their funds through uh, Bitcoin mixers or tumblers um, once they've received those funds. Um, but thankfully for defenders and uh, specifically for us as we're going through this tool, um, it's also um, an immutable public ledger, um, which allows us to, as you'll, as you'll see um, in, in the next few slides, um, to use a few um, Bitcoin addresses associated with this illicit activity um, to trace all transactions that um, were related to it to um, pretty confidently uh, create a cluster that we identify as um, a ransomware campaign attacker's wallet. Um, and that brings us to um, one of the points of our tool um, and research is that Bitcoin balances can be predictors of ransomware campaigns ramping back up. Um, we've um, tried to incorporate this this uh, idea into what we um, built as an early warning system, um, which we um, do by monitoring Bitcoin wallets um, and their balances and seeing if any kinds of anomalous activity um, or any patterns that we can find from there um, are indicators of activity happening out off the blockchain. And if we can map that back to other sorts of observables, such as IPs or hashes. Um, and we do this by using a four-step workflow. Um, we start off by uh, harvesting seeds, which are, uh, which um, is what we identify as Bitcoin addresses that victims have paid the ransom to um, in a couple of crypto uh, 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 crypt ransomware campaigns that have used Bitcoin as a form of payment. And um, from these addresses, we form clusters that we then identify as the attacker's wallet, and we monitor these clusters for um, cyber teams and analysts to then use um, to actively defend. So just going back to what we were first saying, um, we use seeds um, to begin the cluster, and um, an idea of a seed uh, could be the address you see in the top right um, in this screenshot from WannaCry. Um, where the attacker is asking for $600 worth of Bitcoin um, to be sent to that address. And so most of the time these addresses are randomly generated and once the funds are sent to the uh, attacker, a uh, decryption key is sent back. Um, and we were able to find these seed addresses from about two or three dozen um, open sources. Um, so we then take that address, which alone is really just a random data point, and we expand this data set using um, what we call um, uh, a multi-input or co-spend heuristic. Um, and to, to expand this data set, we actually used an open source blockchain explorer called BlockSci. Um, so here we start off with the seed address and recursively look for all addresses that shared um, inputs in transactions with that original seed address um, to where we have this final cluster, which is what we identify as the attacker's wallet. Um, so Nick is going to go into our specific uh, demo that looks into the CryptoLocker campaign. 
So yeah, as Olivia said, um, we're gonna do like a deep dive into how the Crypto Locker campaign evolved. Crypto Locker was a ransomware that first appeared in September 2013, and then it evolved. There was a couple of releases after that uh, of Crypto Locker, which basically leveraged that initial version and built on top of it. The second one was Crypto Defense, which was a release around um, February 2014. And it was short-lived. And then afterwards, came uh, Crypto Wall with all its version one through four. Uh, the interesting thing is that you can basically track that evolution of that specific ransomware by looking at blockchain data and uh, connecting some of the cluster of Bitcoin addresses. Exactly, they map out to the releases of these uh, different tools. So I'm going to go to the tool now. So what basically uh, the tool allows the user to do is to, like, to look at the different uh, malware families that, that we were tracking. Uh, the latest one actually was, uh, was uh, something that was observed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's called Crypto Wallet Hijacker. Uh, it was a tool that was uh, changing the Bitcoin address that was receiving the funds. And so if it would, uh, let's say uh, Olivia wants to send funds to me, crypto wallet hijacker would uh, flip the Bitcoin addresses and put the attacker's uh, wallet address to it. Uh, but going back to crypto locker, so if you click on one of the malware families, the, f the thing that we showcase to the user is uh, the balance associated to the cluster of Bitcoin addresses associated to that campaign. So as Olivia said, starting from a seed, uh, that appeared within that malware, specific malware sample, you can reconstruct a cluster that you can hypothesize that is associated to the wallet of the attackers. Uh, and to gain confidence in the result, you really need to uh, map out whatever you're observing on the blockchain with events outside the blockchain. So for example, we know that the first release of CryptoLocker, as I said on the previous slide, was uh, in September, and it ended, and that campaign ended, uh, or crypto defense was released around March. So you would expect that crypto lockers, uh, um, that they would stop receiving funds between these two uh, dates. So, and indeed, if you look at the, at the result from that cl cluster and the balances, you see that the, the that cluster of, of Bitcoin addresses started receiving funds on around September 7th uh, of 2013. So two days after technically uh, the, that software was released. And then uh, you can see that the balance really evolved September through the end of 2015. And you have a peak here of uh, where the attackers had around $140,000 in that specific wallet. Then that campaign started ramping down around February until these guys exfiltrated uh, all their money out of, the, of, the, of, the, of this wallet. Then after this was dying down, crypto locker was dying down, what was interesting is when you start looking at the crypto defense uh, blockchain data. So here starting with uh, I think one seed from, from crypto uh, defense, we were able to reconstruct two clusters, so basically two wallets associated with crypto defense. What was interesting in that particular release is that it didn't make uh, a lot of money as much, so it didn't make as much money as um, CryptoLocker did in the beginning. So it wasn't a successful uh, campaign for these guys. And one of the reasons uh, that we were able to identify is that it had a cryptographic bug. So these guys, so the victims were able to easily decrypt the data uh, that they, these attackers tried to encrypt. And like, Compared to a peak of $140,000 for uh, crypto locker, crypto defense really like didn't make enough revenues. Which brings us to the um, third release, which was crypto crypto wall. Crypto wall was was actually particularly uh, tenacious, as in terms of how much revenue these guys collected. I think I estimated around four million dollars, and. 
we were able to identify around, I think, 13 clusters uh, of Bitcoin addresses associated with CryptoWall. Um, and these clusters or wallets, I mean, there's two hypotheses as to why there were so many clusters or so many different wallets. One hypothesis that I can think of was that there were different minor releases which were associated of that software, which were associated to, um, to, 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 to CryptoWall. Uh, the other hypothesis is that there were, uh, as ransomware was evolving as a ransomware as a service uh, type of uh, um, industry, um, probably there could be other attackers that were leveraging that code and also releasing campaigns. And what is interesting is that like some campaigns were relatively way more successful than other than others. So like there could be some intelligence outside the blockchain as to why that specific campaign was more, maybe like their, their phishing emails or whatever were more targeted or like there, there has to be something to make it more successful. Uh, but also the, the, the other thing is that the ransomware becomes more successful if the cryptography is strong. So CryptoWall was the first software to implement really strong like uh, rigorous RSA cryptography, which was hard to break and which is why if you look closer at the balance data, there were a bunch of, of these wallets cluster which made a, a, a lot of money. And one of them, uh, around the end, like around August 2015, had a balance of around $180,000. Uh, and then, basically, as I said, CryptoWall came in uh, right after Crypto Defense, and uh, they were able to patch that cryptographic bug and implement rigorous uh, cryptography. And if you look closely, the, one of these clusters, the orange cluster, uh, made three times more money than uh, the crypto defense. And then what we offer in this tool is like, your ability to... Oh. Dig deeper into each one of, of, of these clusters. So like, as I said, CryptoWall version one was started around, I think it was released around April 2014, and you start seeing that first wallet uh, making money around May 2014, and at some point, they made around 60 Bitcoin. The most interesting uh, wallet or version that made a lot of money was CryptoWall uh, three, which at some point was able to collect like you can see here, 800 Bitcoin uh, at, at one specific point in time. So if these guys huddled, as they say in the crypto community, they kept their Bitcoin, they're probably millionaires right now. But going back, uh, the other thing is I want to I uh, tell you guys is that we open source uh, that code, so like it's easily downloadable from our own uh, GitHub repository at TrueStar, TrueStar White Rabbit. Um, what you need for that code to, to operate is a running instance that contains BlockSci, which is an, our analytical tool to allow us to explore the blockchain and do some of the analytics and the clustering that is necessary for us to reconstruct uh, the clusters. Uh, so what you would need to do is, let's say you want to run one of the, exam the, uh, the example notebook that we released as part of this uh, tool, uh, you would need to spin up uh, a node uh, having like a block size node, which allows you to uh, pull in the latest uh, blockchain data. And uh, from our experience, it required a large AWS uh, instance because the blockchain data right now, I think, is around, at least for Bitcoin, is around 140 gigabytes. Uh, so it's a lot of data. Anyway, coming back to, like, let's say the example, there's a, a couple of utility functions that we built for, that, that's wrapped around that tool, but I'll go quickly as to, like, what are the steps for you to reconstruct these clusters? Um, so the first thing is you need to basically, what you would do is initialize the blockchain. Uh, then afterwards, you could set the heuristics for you to perform the clustering. So by heuristic, is, uh, as Olivia explained, in this case we used uh, the co-spending heuristics which allow you to uh, 
determine which Bitcoin addresses spend together towards a certain transaction. And this is basically that allows you to stipulate that the cluster that you, that you were able to uh, obtain is associated to uh, one wallet, one user's wallet. For the crypto locker case, we were able to identify two main seed uh, addresses. And the seed addresses, as I said, are the Bitcoin uh, addresses that were uh, the receivers of the funds from the victims. From that, the seed addresses, you basically uh, create that address object that BlockSci allows you to build. And then you want to find the specific cluster that is associated uh, with that Bitcoin address. So you would obtain the, the in this case, uh, we, the heuristic was uh, removed a heuristic that is called a change heuristic, but I'm not gonna go into it. And then for, for CryptoLocker, what I'm printing out, the result that I'm printing out here is the number of Bitcoin addresses that were uh, associated to that wallet. So from, for CryptoLocker specifically, uh, we were able to reconstruct uh, 968 Bitcoin addresses associated to the wallet of CryptoLocker. And then from it, from that cluster that you find, what the, this tool, uh, what this, uh, what BlockSite allows you is to uh, obtain all the transactions that transacted with that specific cluster that you constructed. And basically, that allows you uh, to compute things such as the volume of money that f uh, went or flowed into that cluster or into that wallet. So for, crypto wa for CryptoLocker, the first version, the volume of money that uh, what transacted with that cluster was around $11.8 million. And then we also build a utility function, which allows you to rebuild uh, these balances associated to uh, that specific cluster. So from it, for example, in this, in this function, uh, you're able to obtain the block heights at which the transactions happen, and then for these block heights, uh, you can obtain uh, the balances. And of course, you can plot it at the end. Uh, it's true that, for example, in this graph, so this is the graph that, was, that I was showing in the tool that is hosted already. Um, it shows you data from uh, uh, September 2013, which was the start of CryptoLocker, till uh, the end of 2017. But the reason is that these end date were so large, there's a lot of uh, researcher out there that performed these uh, micropayments in order to be able to reconstruct the clusters and determine if like, uh, reconstruct the wallet. So the, the reason they do it is if there's no payment or money flowing through these Bitcoin addresses, it wouldn't be possible to reconstruct uh, the cluster. So that was, I, I thought, interesting. Even though the actual campaign for the first version of CryptoLocker ended around uh, uh, March or February 2014. Which bring us actually, now that I discussed a little bit uh, what we did and, and showed the tool, uh, to a final uh, proposition uh, that we'd like to make as part of, of this release. So I think as uh, security um, like threat intel analysts, we have to think about how we can leverage data on the blockchain and how we can leverage Bitcoin addresses and add it as part of a, an indicator to the, to the pyramid of pain. And I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna explain. I mean, this is debatable, of course. Uh, it's not final. Uh, so, Bitcoin addresses have like some interesting characteristics. Uh, the first characteristic is more similar to hashes, as in uh, you can easily use a Bitcoin address in like some link analysis and compare events to each other, and the links are as accurate as a hash. Uh, the other thing is that. They're also kind of, I mean, they're easy to generate, right? Like hashes are easy to, to generate. You change one bit in the, in the code and you have a different hash. Bitcoin addresses also in some ways uh, share that attribute as in the sense that attackers or anyone really can use any open source tool or like whatever, like a service, commercial service to generate a wallet or to obtain a wallet and generate new Bitcoin addresses and a, pub and a public uh, private key pair. Um, so in a way, th that's the easy part. But th th the cool part, the other characteristic of Bitcoin is that they in some way share some form of TTP about, uh, like the, about the, the attackers. In the sense that 
because blockchain data is immutable, uh, researcher and forensic experts or, or even government agencies can look at the blockchain data and investigate uh, the behavior forever. It's something that is always going to be there and it's always available. And the attackers can't do anything about it. And once you investigate on the public blockchain, you can easily, uh, if you're an, uh, an offensive person, you can easily disrupt uh, the payment system of the attacker. So that could be really a really painful attack that you can perform on these attackers. So in some way, that's why I consider it as like a, um, a characteristic that is similar to TTPs as it, in the sense that it's very painful if you disrupt that payment system. Um, and on average, I considered adding it basically to right in the middle, being an in-between TTPs maybe and hashes. Um, there's, of course, a lot of uh, future work that we'd like to perform. Uh, one, one problem we identified is a lot of the time you're heavily uh, reliant on uh, the, the seed addresses that are the start of, of the clustering methodology. If you don't have enough intelligence, if you don't have malware samples, uh, you're not able to reconstruct basically all, all of these clusters uh, based on this methodology. So you wouldn't be able to uh, track the campaigns uh, as efficiently. One potential solution to make this more like, uh, usable by everybody is to have like a common repository maybe for seed addresses where like if someone or, or uh, detonated a malware sample and collected a Bitcoin address, it's, it's important to share it and link it and associate it to a specific ransomware family so that the defenders are able to track balances uh, of that specific particular wallet. Um, the other uh, aspect of it is that there were, there's a lot of missing uh, labeled data, particularly around uh, whitelists. So it's, it's uh, basically, it's very hard uh, to determine, or not very hard, but like um, sometimes uh, the heuristics that we showcase in terms of reconstructing the clusters could, bet, could get contaminated by something called a coin join transaction which is a transaction that launders money uh, that was made by these attackers. And its, very, it, its behavior is in some way similar to the co-spending uh, heuristic that is used to build these clusters. And if you encounter uh, one of these, you might be able to build a cluster that is associated to like maybe a mixing service or even a uh, an exchange. So you can end up getting thousands or hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin addresses that are associated to an exchange. So in some way, if there's an ability for uh, uh, exchanges and uh, other tools to provide maybe defenders with whitelisted Bitcoin addresses, that could be super helpful. The other aspect is the computational uh, complexity. Sometimes it is very slow to uh, compute clusters for some of these addresses. The other thing is that like, if you want to, let's say, leverage uh, things like ML, there's, I think right now, there's around 140 million different clusters. Uh, if you perform the clusters on the whole blockchain, uh, so that gives you a sense about the scale of, of the problem. So there's 140 million clusters, and if you want to compute some form of, let's say I uh, computed some, I did some time series an analysis about how these uh, wallets associated to bad actors behave, and I want to compare it to other clusters that are unlabeled uh, on the blockchain, it's, it's a highly uh, computationally complex uh, uh, problem. The final, the final problem is, of course, the, a matter of uh, ethics and privacy, right? Like, uh, these tools can be used also by bad guys for surveillance and monitoring of transactions. That, that data is public, anybody can use it. You can link any off-the-chain off data to uh, blockchain transaction and try to determine who transacted and what were they doing. So you can do a lot of surveillance that is, could be um, uh, challenging morally. And you can also um, have arbitrary discrimination in the sense of like, let's say you start building these heuristics and clusters and identify like different um, risks associated to Bitcoin addresses, some people could, could leverage these type to discriminate against uh, uh, specific people and not allow them uh, payments. So as a community, like, I think we need more engagement from good actors to be able to resolve uh, some of these, some of these uh, 
uh, issues. And again, thank you for uh, listening in. And basically, as I said, this tool is, is open source. And if you have any question for me or Olivia, uh, please like, um, share this question with us. And like, we're ready, happy to take uh, questions right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a very good question, and we were like playing around with it for a while. Um, so, in terms of, of, of a warning system, it's more it's if you were not the victim, maybe you're. It's more about like if you're a security operator and you know that specific ransomware is uh, ramping up or ramping back up. This is where it allows you to defend, and you, if you haven't been hit, this is what I mean by by a warning system. It's not really in terms of a system for uh, or crypto exchanges to for them to block these transactions or something like that. Maybe I, did I understand your question correctly? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, uh, could you do that though? Could you expand upon this idea and find the crypto exchanges to block transactions? I think so. I think, but it requires more uh, like ML based approach in the sense where like you directly identify something as, as bad. But this requires, of course, like much more investment and computing power and, and yeah, it's. More questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.